today, if you want to follow along. But I asked you a question to start out with. What's your big deal? What's the big deal for you? Lots of people have things that are big deals for them in our country today and around the world, too. We hear about it on the news all the time. But it's worth thinking about for us, what is your big deal? Hmm. For some people, it's something that somebody did for them or did to them. Perhaps it's an inconvenience that you had, or maybe, as we've heard, several different health issues. That's a big deal for those people. Some are really big deals, some are not as big a deal. People traipse the planet in search of something to fulfill their lives. I recently read or heard about, and I'm sure you did too, about a woman who got bit by a shark out surfboarding. And I think it was New Jersey, just this last week. She would have been killed had her husband not been close by on another surfboard and swam over and started punching the shark as hard as he could in the nose and in the eyes, and finally the shark let go of her. But she was an environmentalist. She was concerned that the shark might have got hurt. She's had many surgeries to repair the bite on her leg, but she was worried about the shark. Really? But it was a big deal to her. Anyway, if her husband wouldn't have been close by, she would have been dead. But thankfully, he knew what to do to get the shark off from her. Well, in our study today in Nehemiah, at the end of chapter 9, I'm not going to go through all of chapter 9. Oh, yes, I forgot. We forgot to do the missions report. <laughs> oh, boy. Rookies, come on up, Eva. Give us a mission report, and I'll continue my message afterwards. That's a big deal, too. Pam was waving the missions envelope at me. Come on up. <laughs> Well, we can do it at the end of the message if you want. We need to do it today, though. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. I've been pastoring for 20 years, and I still forget stuff. <laughs> anyway. So, anyway. <clears throat> time and time again, the Lord has extended his grace to the people of Israel. He extended his grace to them time and time again. They would... Go through the time of the judges. If you, remember, if you ever read through the book of Judges, it's kind of depressing because a people group would come and intercede or intervene and on God's request, they would come and invade the nation. And when they got really tired of that, they would cry out to the Lord and, and he would send a judge to deliver them time and time again. Well, all through this chapter 9 was a reiteration of what God had done for them. And the, and the thing is that's very apparent in chapter 9 is this. God is faithful. Do you ever experience God's faithfulness? God is faithful. They were not. Many times they were not faithful. But God never gave up on them. He was always faithful to them. So when the judge died... They threw the book of the law behind them, and they went back to doing what they were doing before. God would send another army down upon them, and they would be overcome, they would be conquered, and for years they would suffer under their oppression, and another judge would be, laid up, uh, be uh, brought up, and they would follow the Lord as long as the judge was alive. Such was the case with Samuel. That was the case there. Isaiah 53, verses 5 to 4 says this. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each have turned to his own way. What is the big deal in this verse? But he was pierced through. That's the big deal. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastening for our well-being has fallen on him. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. So even though we were like sheep and we had turned away, each to our own thing, Christ went to the cross for us. Even though, even if we're not faithful, 
God is still faithful. Paul quoted from several various psalms in, resurrection, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 19. And it's not a very happy verse to read because it's the story of unregenerated mankind and to some extent, even those of us who are Christians. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 to 19 says, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. Their tongues keep deceiving. The poison of vipers is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. The path of, path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This was the condition of Judah and Israel before the deportation. And it's a condition of everyone who doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They might get mad at you for telling them that, but it's re reality is the truth. Well, un unregenerated mankind doesn't seek after God for the most part. Well, there was an end to the Lord's patience, and he's deported them out. But he didn't abandon them. In Babylon, he was with them. He was with people like Daniel, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, people like Esther, Mordecai. You can list off the names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all those who were in Israel. He didn't abandon his people. He, he continually was concerned for their well-being. Now, in Nehemiah, they're ready to make an agreement with the Lord. And that's in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 38. They're ready to make an agreement with the Lord. And the agreement is this, that they're going to follow the law of Moses. They're going to follow the old covenant. So Nehemiah chapter 9 Verse 38, now, it became, now because of all this, we are making an agreement in writing. And on a sealed document are the names of our leaders, our Levites and our priests. The first name on that list is Nehemiah. And I'm not going to read all those names in the 26 verses because I don't think I can pronounce them right. But it reminded me, if you remember, what happened on July 4th, 1776. Is there any history buffs here? Signing of the Declaration of Independence, or I mean the ratification of it by the Second Continental Congress, and the signing was done on August 2nd, 1776. That's when our country was birthed as a nation. I bring that up just because of the signatures. There were 52 signers of that document. Many paid with their lives. But they are signing an oath to obey the Lord. They aren't signing and a declaration of independence from God, they're signing the declaration of dependence on God. There's a huge difference there. Nehemiah 10, 28, now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all those who had separated themselves from all the people of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons and daughters, all those who had knowledge in understanding, are joining with, the, with their kinsmen, their nobles, and making themselves a curse and an oath to walk on God's law, which was given through Moses, God's servant, and to keep and to observe all the commandments of, of God our Lord, and his ordinances and his statutes, that we will not give our daughters to the people of the land or take their daughters for our sons. You can see that the people of Judah were making this a big deal. This was a big deal to them. Why was that important, that they not join up with the people of the land? God commanded them not to for a reason. There were several reasons why they were not to join up with the people of the land. First of all, the people of the land did lead them to worship of false gods, because that's what they worshipped. And as soon as they were marrying and intermarrying and making covenants with the people of the land, which they were not supposed to do, because God knew they would be led astray. They were under judgment. God said, make no covenant with them. So 
So he goes on. As for the people of the land who bring wares or grain on a Sabbath to sell, we will not buy from them on a Sabbath or a holy day, and we will forego the crops of the seventh year, an exacting of every debt. In Israel, even today, on a Sabbath, many businesses close. You can, there are some places you can't go shop at on a Sabbath because they recognize the Sabbath, even today. But the failure to give the land a rest every seven years was another reason for the deportation. God says, if you won't give the land a rest, I'll give it 70 years of rest. You know, if you're a farmer, you know that it's important not to plant crops, or at least the same crop, on the land every year because you deplete the land. If you do, you have to add fertilizer and all kinds of other things to replenish the land, otherwise the crop, the land will fail. It won't produce a crop. I just told you everything I know about farming, and I may be taking the task for that, so. <laughs> Second reason why they were not to make a covenant with the people of the land is like making a covenant with the world. We are commanded, they were commanded not to make a covenant with the people of the world was like making a covenant with the God of this world. They were to be set apart. They were to be a people who were set apart for God. Different than the people around them. What made them different was their relationship with the Lord, right? So that made them different because of their relationship with the Lord. They had the law, they observed the law, they, you know, all the nations did sacrifices. That didn't make them different. But it was their relationship with the Lord that made it different. God still desires a people set apart for himself today. It's called the church. So much of the church today wants to be like the world around them. But God wants a church that is set apart whether Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. As long as you're part of the church, you're to be set apart. But the church wants to be like the world. And so did Israel. They, they came to Samuel one day. The elders and the leaders of the people came to Samuel and said, give us a king. And Samuel was not happy. He was very displeased. And so they went and he went and talked to the Lord, and the Lord said, you know, they're not rejecting you, Samuel, as king. They're rejecting me as king. He said, tell them what a king will do, how he will oppress them, how he will take their best from them for himself. And if they still want a king, give it to them. And you know what they said? No, we will have a king. Just like all the nations around us. They had the very best king in the Lord, but and it wasn't his best for them. But he said, okay, if that's what they want, give it to them. Sometimes you have to be careful what you ask for. You might get it. But that wasn't God's best. So Samuel did what the Lord said and appointed a king for them. We are not to take on the world's values or make a covenant with the world. James said in James 4.4, 4, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend with the world makes himself an enemy of God. I don't want to be enemies with God. How about you? It's not a good place to be. In retrospect, they were now going to keep the Sabbath, not to buy or sell on the Sabbath. They are going to give the land a rest, every seventh year, and eradicate the debts on the seventh year. They were going to uh, contribute funds to the temple in a yearly donation, verses 32 to 33. We also place ourselves under obligation to contribute one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God for the purpose... <clears throat> for what purpose was the money given? To purchase showbread for the continual grain offering, 
for the continual burnt offerings, the Sabbath, the new moon, and for the appointed times, for the holy things, and for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel, and for all the work of the house of our God. So they, had, they were now obligating themselves, out of, not out of a sense of obligation, but a sense of joy, being able to do that. They were going to give a half shekel a year to, the, to furnish the temple, to keep the temple going. The rest of the chapter covers what is needed for the temple worship and who will provide it. Verse 34, likewise, we cast lots for the supply of wood among the priests. I remember reading in our history book that there used to be a wood furnace down in the basement of this church, and that's how they heated the church. And the pastor at that time had to come over the night before and fire up the wood stove. People from the church supplied the wood. Just a little rabbit trail. So they provided wood for the burnt offering. According to our father's households, at fixed times annually, to burn on the altar of the Lord of God. It is written that, you know, as it is written in the law. There are things that go on here at church that are done behind the scenes. Many things are done behind the scenes, and you don't know they're doing it unless it isn't done. People go around, clean up stuff, or take the bulletins out of the chairs. Somebody does the bulletin board, somebody does the cleaning, somebody does the lawn mowing, somebody supplies, buys the supplies and makes sure they're here in the kitchen. There's always stuff that is being done behind the scenes here at our church. We couldn't function without it, without all these things that are going on. Verses 35 to 36. That they might bring in the first fruits of our ground, and their first fruits from every tree of the house to the house of the Lord annually, and bring in the house of our into the house of our God, and the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle and our flocks, as it is written in the law, for the priests are ministering in the house of our God. So, the priesthood had to be supplied. They had to have food to eat, just like you and I. So it was the responsibility of the people to supply the uh, necessary things f for the priests to live, for the Levites and the priests to live. God provided for everyone. And if they followed his word, people were taken care of. And that's what they were doing. You might be thinking, what about their sons? What did they do with that? Well, they had to redeem them back with an offering for their sons. But they had to bring the firstborn of their sons to the temple. Well, you realize Jesus was God's one and only son. And he was given for our redemption from our sin. Ephesians 1, 7, we read, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. It's a big deal, isn't it, for you? that Jesus gave himself for us. It's a big deal. Verses 37 to 39, Nehemiah 10. We also bring the first of our dough. So if you make, made bread, you would bring your dough to the temple or to the Levites, our contribution, the fr fruit of every tree, the new wine and the oil to the priests at the chambers of the house of God and a tithe of our ground to the Levites. For the Levites, Levites are they who receive the tithes in all rural towns. And the priests of the son of Aaron shall be with the Levites when the Levites shall bring up a tenth to the house of the Lord. So the Levites received a, you know, a tenth of the, what the people had, and then they brought a tenth to the house of God. That was a tithe. They brought a tenth. I found that interesting. They tithe out of what they got. For the sons of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of the grain, the new wine, and oil to the chambers. And, are the and there are the utensils of the sanctuary, the priests who have been ministering, the gatekeepers and the singers. They will not, thus we will not neglect the house of our God. See, that, they weren't always good at doing that. 
But now they're making a, an agreement, a covenant, uh, that they're going to take, do the things that God had called them to do. What was their motivation in all this? It was written down. It was a contract that they made with the Lord, but that was done joyfully in service to the Lord and our desire to serve him. Is it a big deal for you to be able to serve the Lord? It was done to worship and celebrate his grace to them. They were ready to obey his voice once again. H. H. Rawls, who was a 20th century English Baptist theologian and pastor, wrote several books on the topic of the worship of Israel. He said this, the first element in worship is adoration. The Hebrews expressed this by their posture, not just by their words. For they prostrated themselves before God. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. They did not come with an easy familiarity into the presence of God, but as awareness of his greatness. A sense of awe about who God is. It was a big deal to come into his presence. But the biggest deal was always when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain where the temple was torn in two. Now, I could probably tear one of those curtains pretty easily, but you couldn't tear that curtain very easily. It was a very thick, heavy curtain, several layers thick, but it was torn in two from top to bottom, where the rings were, where it was hanging, all the way down to the bottom. Why? Because now, because of Jesus' death on the cross and his cleansing us from sin, we can come into the presence of God. Whereas before, only the high priest could come into the presence, and that with blood, and once a year. Now, we, we don't even think about it. We just come and pray to the Lord and ask for something. That's no problem. Why? Because of the blood of Christ. What's your big deal today? I hope it is worship of the Lord and serving him with all of our hearts. No matter how ho-hum our life may be, and we might be wishing for a little more ho-hum with all, everything that's going on, there are things many of us enjoy doing, but they should not be our big deal. Our big deal is Jesus. I think I mentioned this one other time, and it's kind of a funny story, but I'm going to mention it again because it fits so well. I like to watch a show called Barnwood Builders. How many have seen that show on, on TV? It's kind of fun to watch it. Anyway, when they tear down a cabin or a barn, they, and they get to the floorboards or the deck, they peel off the floorboards. They, they save these cabins from rotting away, and they build new cabins out of them. Anyway, they're looking for marbles and artifacts. So they're always digging around looking for marbles, especially marbles is the big deal to them to find it, a, a marble. And they could be old clay marbles, they could be glass marbles or whatever, or some sort of artifact, tool, an ax head or something like that. Anyway, uh, Johnny Jett had just found a really nice marble and he was showing everybody. And his boss, Mark Bow, said, Johnny, what's the best thing you ever found, Jesus? It didn't take him a half a second. Jesus, I hope he's your big deal today, too. I hope he's the best thing that you've ever found in your life. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Lord, we want to be the big deal to you because you're the big deal. You made us your big deal at the cross, Lord. When you went to the cross, And you died for our sins. That's a really big deal. And oh Lord, as we prepare to hear our missions report, we want to hear how Dan and Mary Lee are serving us, Lord, but Lord, we just give you thanks for what you have done. We glorify you. We lift you up. 
In Jesus' name, amen.